It's live. You're alive. You're alive. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everybody. This is a nice, nice group to turn out on this lovely evening. Um, when I was looking at uh, Vicky's book, it, uh, it struck me that we have had a, uh, the predecessor of this book a few years ago, a book called Plenty, uh, a couple from uh, British Columbia who, who uh, tried to eat within a hundred mile radius of their home and, and did pretty well uh, by it. I think they could even have coffee. <laughs> which to me is a, you know, without coffee there is no life. Uh, but, um, so that, this is kind of, this is kind of follows, uh, follows uh, on right after that. And then I, I got to thinking about uh, other people who have had uh, tested themselves like this and, and what it does uh, for them spiritually and politically and all kinds of ways. Like, and uh, Cory Booker came to mind. He was, had to, made, him live, made himself live for, I think, a week or two weeks, I forget, only on food stamps and right. to see how, how one can live that way, which is not very well. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, teaches you a lot about your own uh, capabilities and your own creativity and uh, um, all sorts of, sorts of things come up. And uh, so Vicky, Vicky's book is interesting because it, it also talks about how, how she got to be in touch with her community as well and what, and what you know, living within a 10, eating food within a 10 mile radius does for your sense of, of uh, community, and uh, there's lots of, lots of lessons to be learned. Uh, so I'm going to let her take it from here. Won't you please welcome Vicki Rao? Mm. Right. Thank you so much, and I am so glad to be here at Reader's Books. Thank you for having me. Uh, eat, sleep, read local, eat local, and read and sleep local. So, uh, and cultivate community and shop indie. So we're on the same page as it were. Uh, so thank you for having me here at Reader's Books in Sonoma. And indeed, I think that what you're saying, you said in essence, so much of what happened for me in trying to do a 10 mile diet, which was not only did I not starve, which was pretty good, um, but I also looked for food and I found friends. I found a sense of belonging. And I did get politicized. You know, you start to fall in love with your farmers and it's not just adorable little people out there with some dirt under their nails. People are scramble, scratching, they're, they're scratching up the wall trying to provide food for us in a, in a circumstance which is, makes it really hard. Uh, so all of the above. So I'll just tell some stories. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, um, next time when I'm here and I come back, we'll circle up, right? And we're all going to tell our own stories. Uh, this time it's just me and a book tour telling my story. But I am very interested in what's happening here. You know, you are the, you are the epicenter of terroir on, uh, on, in the United States. You know, somebody said to me when I started writing this book, oh, you know, about terroir. And I thought, you know, no, I don't. <laughs> but, you know, this is really the place. This, this, your region is where the idea of regional cuisine reemerged in our country. Uh, so I am happy to be back, back in, be in this territory. So just briefly to say about the book so that I don't forget to say the important overview things. Yes, it's called Blessing the Hands That Feed Us, What Eating Closer to Home Can Teach Us About Food, Community, and Our Place on Earth. And so it is a narrative of, of, of all the funny things and crazy things that I did in order to eat within 10 miles of my home on Whidbey Island. And interspersed in every chapter that takes you through the story are exercises sort of like a Boy Scout manual. It's not exactly like a manual because it's not comprehensive. It's not sequential. It's not a program. It's not you start at A and you go to Z and by the time you're at Z you'll be perfected being of some sort or another. Uh, it, it, but it really does have a lot of exercises to help you integrate what I'm talking about and rehearse it in your own life. And uh, then my publisher said that I had to have recipes in there and I thought, I am a lame cook. I don't, <laughs> I don't you know, I mean, I, I, you, you know, like, uh, you wash a potato, you put it in the oven. 
but uh, I figured out how to do it, which is that the chefs of my island who um, uh, serve local food in their restaurants all contributed recipes. So we have really wonderful recipes that can be adapted to your region. Uh, and the book tells, goes all the way from telling my personal story through my awakenings to the political and social environmental issues. Well, actually, coming out of the environmental issues, but awakening to the political issues. And then some frameworks for if communities want to organize around local food. You know, what are some frameworks that we can think about, ways we can think about it, and processes we can use to start to become food system activists in our own regions? So I'll start by reading from the introduction. Oh, I, no, I'm going to read you from, um, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, so this is my dedication. I dedicate this book to all the children born just about now. May you be, have a green growing things outside your door. May you flourish in a garden world. May you have plenty to eat. May our generations have done something simple and good for you through encouraging sustainable agriculture and thriving local communities. And then they wanted me to do an epigraph, you know, quote somebody who was a hero or heroine. So of course I quoted Wendell Berry, because I haven't read one word of Wendell Berry's that doesn't move me to my core. But, but that didn't, you know, it was sort of stentorian. It was sort of like deep and important. So I also have a little quote here from my alter ego. Her name is Phyllis Swartzel. She's from New York. <laughs> and she went out to visit a daughter, Rachel, on Woodby Island. And, and um, you know, Rachel's very into local food, which she, I say, of course. In New York, we are too. You know, you go down to the street, and it's right there. <laughs> so we quote Phyllis on that. And. Uh, if I don't succeed in anything else, I think I'll be a stand-up comedian. Um, so anyways, so the introduction starts. In September 2010, I undertook an experiment that turned out to be one of the greatest adventures of my life. It was so small at the start, but it eventually grew and blew me wide open. A farmer friend wanted, to, wanted a guinea pig to test whether she could actually feed another human being for a full month when, from what she could grow on her half acre. Uh, her name's Trisha, and a little backstory: she and her husband Kent were watching Netflix, a takeoff on Super Size Me, you know, Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me? Yeah, it was called Super High Me. Some guy got up every morning, smoked dope, and filmed himself. This doesn't seem unusual <laughs> on the West Coast, but anyway. And her husband turned to her and said, well, you should, we should do Super Veggie Me. You should just eat from your farm, you know, our garden for a month. You know, we should do, we should prove that one. She said, I'm not doing it. I can't live without boot, 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 boot. You do it. And he said, no, -uh, not me. So she went on the hunt for somebody who would be willing to partner with her on this experiment. Um, so enter Vicki. Now, here's a little backstory on me. Not only have I been a sustainability activist for 20 years, I, I had my awakening in the late 80s when I found out that we're an overshoot, that we're using more of the planet every year than can be restored. And for me, that data point was like, you know, my hair's on fire. I just like, I don't know what to do about that. And I spent a lot of time trying to offer simple solutions to run exper personal experiments and then offer simple solutions to other people of how we might live well together within the means of the planet. Um, so I say here, um, I wanted to test from a sustainability perspective if we here on Whidbey Island could survive without access to that cornucopia called the grocery store. We called the experiment a 10-mile diet. I've done other sustainability as an extreme sport experiments many times. I've fasted from food for 10 days, from talking for a month, and uh, which it, it's very interesting if you try that one you'll find out that after like several days of anxiety, like I have something to say about that, you find out that everything you were gonna say, somebody else is, says, you know, so it's very relaxing. Um, and then from air travel for a year. Anything that would bring me closer to a life of integrity. I think sustainability is meant to put, be put into practice, not just debated. So it's also true that I came to this as a 
self-professed yo-yo dieter. <laughs> Do I? I don't know if I say this in the book or they just said it in the PR materials, but suddenly everybody's at, oh, I understand you're a self-professed yo-yo dieter. Yes. <laughs> I was a chubby kid and, you know, it was very early on I found out that I was different from the other kids because I was F-A-T. And so I have spent many years losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight, gaining it back, losing weight, gaining it back, and then some. You know, that whole just pressing process of trying to make my body conform to a social norm. And with Marilyn Monroe, it was one thing, but you know, fast forward to Twiggy and you're really, it's like really hard to keep up with, you know, how thin you ought to be. So I tried everything and I was also a different kind of yo-yo dieter. You know, it's like I read John Robbins and I stopped eating red meat. You know, Diet for New America, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not gonna participate in the dire circumstances. But then I read Eat Right for Your Type and I'm a type O diet. And so I started eating red meat again. <laughs> and then I had, uh, I found out that I was like falling asleep every day after lunch. So I did an elimination diet and I found out that I was allergic to wheat. So I stopped eating wheat and the, the afternoon naps ended. And then I was at a dinner party about 20 years later, and my hostess says, I, you know, here's, would you like some bread? You know, I thought, oh, it's beautiful, but no, I can't. I have, you know, I'm allergic to wheat, you know? So she says, I can fix that. Okay, so she does energy medicine, and she did a 10-minute energy technique with me and sent me home with a bagel. And <laughs> <laughs> ever since then, I can eat wheat. So, you know, it's like, but, but the, all of this, whether it's because of ethics, or because of the latest and greatest health thing, or what Dr. Oz is doing, or what Oprah's doing, or, you know, I, all of these things, they are all distancing us. We have become distanced from any sense of ourselves as eaters in a living food system. We have become disconnected eaters, subject to everybody else's good ideas about what we should put in our mouths and why. And um, so I, I had gotten to that point. So I had just come off a big diet when she asked me, what, Trisha asked me whether I would do this 30-day experiment. Um, so I thought, sure, I can limit myself any which way from Sunday. Uh, but I, um, yeah, and I was also had this sustainability concern. So I said, sure. You know, I'll do this. So this is in July 2010. Thank God we didn't start until September because in August I realized that she's got summer vegetables. This is like not going to work for a month, you know? So there was nothing to stick to the ribs, no grain, no beans, um, no meat, no cheese, no milk. <sighs> so I, we agreed it would be a 10-mile diet because she lived seven miles from my house and 10 was a nice number. So. I could, you know, took, take my little pin in my house and a string of 10 miles and I turned, made the circle and it got as far north as my friend Tara's tomatoes, but no further. It didn't get up to the prairie on Whidbey Island where they grow grain and beans, so no grain, no wheat, no cookies, no crackers, no toast, no crunch. That was a big problem for me because there's two types of people in the world. There's sweetaholics who, when they're sad, they eat, and there's crunchaholics when that when they're frustrated, they need to, you know, and I was very frustrated, I didn't have crunch, so that was like, so, so it was, right away, it was a confrontation with my food assumptions, my habits, what I, you know, how food is woven into my day, hour by hour. You know, there's the, then there's the eating after nine o'clock. You know, there's a new, there's a new meal, you know, snacking has become officially a new meal. And the food industry really wants you to like have your morning snack, your afternoon, you know, to, to find different things that you eat for your snacking meals. You know, when I was a kid, you didn't snack. You saved your appetite for dinner because mother cooked. So, <laughs> so there's the after nine o'clock, you know, and people would ask me, you know, what's your favorite position? I would say, after nine o'clock, a darkened kitchen with the refrigerator door open with a spoon in my hand. That would be my favorite position. <laughs> So I, I had to confront my psychology around my own eating. All the ways that I eat that have nothing to do with nourishment. Um, but I was committed to this experiment. As you say, you know, when you do any kind of Lenten practice, you're, you're reporting in for discoveries to deepen 
yourself, to be, bring to awareness things that are unconscious. And also we do Lent as a dedication to values that we may not be living, to things that we believe are true. And I really thought, think that relocalization is super important. And that was the other thing I brought to this was I had already been working on the whole idea of relocalization in my community. I had helped to start one of the first transition town groups. Is anybody here involved in transition? Yay. Oh, yes. Um, and we all know that it's easy to start and it's, it's hard to keep going. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, entry level way to walk in a door and not have any roadmap really for what to do after that. So I'd started one of the transition groups and that's when I found out that our grocery stores have about three days of food on the shelves. You know? it's, it's the end point of an industrial system. It's constantly being stocked by the industrial system. The trucks roll in and it constantly stocks the grocery store. When you see that there's a hurricane in Haiti or something like that, the next thing they show you is you know, the docks are breaking and then they show you the grocery store that's been emptied because people have made a run on the food. Um, so that was pretty sobering since I live on an island. Uh, and then another data point, I found out that the average age of farm, a farmer in the United States is close to 60 that there's five farmers over 75 for every one farmer under 25. That seems, I now, I heard, you know, I, I heard that 2% of the nation, people in the nation are farmers. And actually, since I first heard that piece of data, it's down below 2%. And when a profession goes below 2%, it ceases to exist. You know, so they're not, it's, it's, it's sort of in a general other pool. So. Um, we're losing our capability of farming, you know, food production, local food production. So, and so I'd asked another farmer friend of mine on Whidbey Island in my, with my transition hat on, could we here on Whidbey Island, a semi-rural, beautiful island, could we here survive on what we can grow? And so she did a quick back of the envelope calculation, you know, 65,000 people, this number of acres you know, zoned as agriculture, things that grow well here, 2,000 calories a day. And she said, yeah, we could survive for two weeks in August. <laughs> so th for me, this is the sort of stuff that sends me on a hunt for something to do about this. Is there, and, and so people talked about local food, but what I noticed about myself and all my friends is that it was quite optional to go to the farmer's market, and mostly you went to see your friends, you know. <laughs> Right? And so it was a social event. And so it's, it's, a good, it's a good step. Direct sales between farmers and consumers is a good step. But it's not a food system. You can't feed a community just on farmers market sales at this point. Uh, so all of that data was roaming around when the opportunity to uh, constrict my diet to 10 miles came up. So I talked a little bit about my hunt for food and, and some of the things that happened. One was that uh, I, first thing I realized, which you said, you know, I'm not gonna live for a month without caffeine. This is, you know, that's, that's a, beyond an extreme sport. <laughs> it's extreme suffering. So I gave myself four exotics, oil, salt, caffeine, and what do you think the fourth was? Chocolate. Yeah, everybody thinks chocolate. <laughs> But I'm a crunchaholic. <laughs> the fourth actually was lemons because I wouldn't eat, I had a health, it was a health practice. I had had cancer and I had this somehow, you know, this sort of mystical belief that if I ate, drank hot lemon water every morning, I would wash my liver. Anyway, it was a thought, but I wasn't going to give that up. You know, I wasn't going to compromise my, my juju about my health. So those were my four exotics. And so if I was going to have tea, I was going to have milk for my tea. So I went looking for milk and I called a friend of mine who had a goat co-op and because I milked her goats and I said, can I buy milk from you for a month? Well, no. You know, selling raw milk to your neighbors is illegal. So not, I'm not entering into the debate about raw milk. Should we drink it? Should we not? Blah, blah, blah. But I'm just saying that it revealed to me that there's the laws and regulations that govern the national food supply are sitting on the shoulders of local producers. And so there is a river of underground food that happens because, you know, people are, people are buying milk in my community. <laughs> Just it's underground. 
So I had to like, you know, go down the rutted road and go over the sagging porch and go past the ugly dog and go into the, you know, like rusty refrigerator, you know, and get my bottle of milk, you know. <laughs> and leave my $18 in the jar where the lid wouldn't come off, you know? <laughs> and so, so anyway, so, so it just, everything was consciousness raising about why it is that something that seems so obvious, fresh local food grown by people you know in your community, communities feeding themselves, how difficult that was. And, and I thought, well, you know, 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, that's how we ate. Primarily local food, that's how communities ate. And I wondered, well, like, how, what happened? You know, how did we give away <laughs> our capacity to feed ourselves? And my universal explanation of everything is that it seemed like a good idea at the time. So there was a lot of things that seemed like a very good idea at the time. They, they are good ideas, we're very grateful for them but cumulatively they have given away our power to feed ourselves. Refrigeration, even before electricity, using ice boxes. Refrigeration allows food to be shipped. Uh, electricity, um, I remember a story about a, a community, I think, it, I, think, um, I think it's told in that book, Jerry Manders' book, Four Reasons for the Elimination of Television. He tells the story of a, of a native community in Alaska where the community was falling apart. You know, that you walk around the community and rather than a you know, communal feast, you see everybody in these little houses with the glow of the television screen. And he asked somebody what happened. And, and they said, what broke our community up was refrigeration. Because when we got the whales before, we all had to have community feasts. But once we had refrigeration, we could just come to the central square, cut it up and take it home. So it's a series of things that have allowed us to break our world apart, to break our communities apart, to break the bonds, and fill those bonds with things like electricity, refrigeration, transportation, you know, the, the uh, transcontinental railroad. The railroad, you know, they used to be that you had to bring, the best way to bring your animals to town, meat to town was on the hoof, you know, because what are you gonna do? put the steer in the back of the cart and have the donkey take the steer into town? No, no, you bring the animals in on the hoof and you have the abattoirs in town. So transportation allowed us to send our food production to the hinterlands. Incredible innovation, very empowering because it's liberated us from having to spend the majority of our time simply on the basic everyday survival issues. But it's landed us in a place where 95% of our food comes from afar. And even when I got, you know, I, I gave myself oil and I went to the store and, you know, I thought, Napa oil, at least I'll get Napa oil. <laughs> you know, at least I'll get Cal and so I, I said, where does the oil come from? And he says, uh, well, it just depends wherever they can get it. You know, so if the crop's good in Tunisia, it comes from Tunisia. But if the crop fails in Tunisia, it comes from Venezuela. And that made me realize that the grocery store is a technology in of itself to deliver a constant supply of food to us so that we never have to think about it. And so what about the, the, you know, the, the, the blight in Tunisia? It matters to the Tunisians, but to cons food consumers, it doesn't matter to us. It's just wherever it can come from so that we have a continuous supply. Brilliant logistical success totally logistical success, the industrial food system, but it's left us disabled. It's also left us disabled in terms of cooking. Like, you know, when I, my friend Trisha started delivering the boxes of food, you know, I would get down to like three green beans, Trisha, <laughs> you need more food. Her husband Kent would say like, Vicki is making out like a bandit, you're giving her free food. <laughs> and, but I said I would blog for food, you know, it's like, I have this little section here I'll, I'll share with you. For, uh, this is from my blog. Uh, for this month at least, it seems that Trisha and I are engaged in an equal exchange. She wakes up in the middle of the night fearing I might starve. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> no, seriously, this challenge is growing her as a market gardener and the cost is a box of veggies and a dozen eggs a week. I am examining my relationship with food and really with the food system and all it costs is 500 words a day. We'll blog for food. <laughs> Um, and actually the blog, I ended up writing 25,000 words that month 
I couldn't stop writing. I had one reader, Tricia, and then in the middle of the month, I had another. <laughs> it, it really wasn't, that wasn't the point. I was falling, it was like I was falling through food. Food became a doorway into the world in an amazing way. Like during that month, I read about food riots in Mozambique, and that would have been a disconnected piece of data in the past. But then I was going, oh, and how did that happen? Oh, it was the wheat crop in Russia failed and Russia stopped exporting wheat. Oh, how did that happen? Oh, climate change had to be the driest season um, in Russia, and so, so the crop burned. And suddenly, and then I started finding out that China is buying up land in Africa to feed China, like soil is the new oil. And you suddenly start to see through these, the lens of food, you start to see what's happening around the world. And you see what's happening inside you and around you and around the world. So I just fell into love with this. Uh, and um, so storytelling. So I think one of the, I'm just going to read a little bit from, um, not only was I finding food and, and finding out about some of the plight of the farmers, some of the challenges that they have, some of my own resistance to spending a little bit more money. That was one thing. I found, a, I found somebody who would deal me some chicken. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I, and so I went over to Toby, and he went out to his freezer, and he handed me two chickens, and he said, that'd be $50. <laughs> it was like $25 a pound. Not $25, $5 a pound, sorry. $5 a pound. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I'm frugal. You see, I, I, I'm, I'm like so into bargaining, you know, and something, getting it cheaper sales. And uh, that was an amazing experience of realizing what it really costs in reality to raise a real chicken. And that chicken was worth, and I don't have to go through the whole litany, but you know, the feed and the, and the, 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 the chicken yard and the chicken house and the, the netting over the top and the predators and the, all of it, all of that labor and cost and losing some birds to predators anyway, all of that went into the $5 a pound. And the question isn't, why is local food expensive? The question is, why is industrial food cheap? And once you start asking that question and following that trail, you start to reveal some of the backstory, the injustice number one. You know, some of us know more stories than others about what farm workers are paid. Uh, and in our communities and also far away, you know, out of sight, out of mind, all we see is the nice package on the shelf. So it's the injustice that the farm workers are not paid enough money to really feed their families. It's the injustice to the animals. You know, free range chicken, I thought I was doing okay. You know, I wasn't buying the, the garbage chicken. No, I'm buying free range chicken and it has a little picture of a chicken out there plucking, you know, you know pecking away. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. And I found out that the, the requirement for free range chicken is that these huge chicken houses have a little door down at the end and a little patch, sort of like a prisoner yard, you know, in a prison, you know, where you can go out and walk around for an hour a day. They have these little yard that the chickens can go out into. And, and one source, and I'm not guaranteeing any of this, one source said, you know, they even actually hold the birds away from the door long enough that the birds don't even know what the door means. But basically, these are not pecking out, these are not pastured chickens. That's what you want to buy if you want to buy a real happy chicken that's happy until the moment it, it surrenders its life for you, it is a pastured chicken, chicken that's out, outside. Um, so it led me to these questions about industrial food and, and some of the reason industrial food is cheaper is because scale actually does matter. You know, it's like if you have a thousand birds or a hundred birds, some, some of the expenses are going to be equal. But the other thing is that the practices, uh, out of sight, out of mind practices. And so got me to thinking too about the economics of, of local food and, and big question I always get is, oh, it's so expensive, I can't afford it. Um, and I agree, totally. <laughs> I mean, that's been my biggest battle with myself. And 
And one of the things I found out is that we spend the smallest percentage of our budget on food of any country in the world. We spend 8 to 10 percent of our budget on, on food. Europeans spend 25. Yeah, that's normal. I remember when I was growing up and I was being, you know, given my first lessons on budgeting, that 25% of my income would go to food. 25% would go to housing and the rest would be other things. So we have developed an expectation in this country of cheap food. We also have uh, diet-related diseases. We have obesity problems. We, we don't, and, and it allows us to abuse food. I'm a food abuser, you know. If I'm happy, I'll eat. If I'm sad, I'll eat. You know, it's like eating, eating as an expression of something that is non-food related is a very easy substance to use. It's a very easy substance to use to manage feelings that have nothing to do with nourishment. So we, uh, spending more for food is really an interesting thing to think about. And, uh, I'm actually even evolving further on this for myself as I tour and speak of like, if, if money wasn't the, you know, if money wasn't the issue, you know, if I was like, oh my God, that's $25 for that chicken help help. You know? <laughs> Eating is, is, this, is the most intimate thing we do on a daily basis fundamentally. There's only two places where we really, a few places in our bodies where we let the outside world in. <laughs> And our mouths are one of the major ways that the world comes into us. It enters us. How intimate could that be? How trusting could that be? And you know, I used to, I used to sort of pour food in there and just think, ah, oh, I got a body. The body can turn anything to me. No problem. But what could be more important than eating good food? You know, and, and if, it, geez, if I have to like let go of my, you know, a super cell phone plan, or if I have to let go of Netflix or audible.com in order to afford good food, what am I thinking? You know, I just want to present that as a question I'm working with of like, what is having really good food grown so that it's just, it's grown in soil that's, that's, that's alive, that's tended well by real people. What is that worth to me? And also, you know, another conclusion is, as with this bookstore, local is important because if I don't buy local food, I don't have local farmers, you know? And if I, you know, I've, I'm giving up my Trader Joe habit. This is really hard, folks. <laughs> you know, like my Trader Joe almonds. And then I just did an analysis. If I want a grocery store in my town and I won't buy the food that they go to the trouble of bringing into my town, it's a small locally owned grocery store, I don't get to have a grocery store. You know, we don't understand that, you know, so far the disassembly of the local business communities has not touched us very much. Well, I'll just go online. You know, I'll order from, you know, something something.com. But we really want a local community because not only do the local businesses provide services for us, but they provide a, a, a focal point for a group of people who can identify with a shared destiny together in this place. And that is precious. One of the byproducts of my diet, as you said, was that I developed a sense of community um, beyond what, something I'd ever even imagined. You know, I, I hadn't realized that I hadn't actually eaten any, I hadn't lived anywhere because I hadn't eaten from that place. I, haven't, I hadn't cast my destiny in with a, a real place on the planet. I'd even bought a house, but it was all, everything sort of optional. Like, God, do I look good on Whidbey Island? And maybe I, I would look better on Vashon Island. You know, it's sort of like it's all optional. It doesn't have reality. But now that I live in a real place with real people, with a shared destiny, it, it, it's done a lot of, of things for me that I didn't know, like it filled a hole I didn't know was empty called belonging. Being claimed as one's own by a people in a place. You know, diet used to mean how people in a place eat. It is their culture. It's not diet tink. So these are all the transformations. And I know I'm not reading much from the book because I'm really wanting to tell you these stories. And I think I'm gonna, I'm going to, 
pause now and have some conversation and probably something will be said or asked that will lead me back into another little quote from the book. Um, and then I will finish up with one of the little inspiring passages or another. So I do want to open it up for questions, comments. Uh, if you want to share some of the events that are happening or some of the groups that are happening here that are contributing to relocalization, I'm happy to hear that. Whatever you want to say or ask, impertinent or not. Yeah? Uh, when you were, it sounds like you did get some things for free for free or for trade in terms of the food, but did you figure out the percentage that the local food uh, budget-wise might have met? In other words, was it was it 20 percent? Right, that's a good food? question. I haven't done that calculation, but um, it's an inter. Okay, so that's a, that is a great question because when you belong to, to a place and to a people and you're known, there is food that comes to you for free. That is true. Not only do you, you know, not only do you get the extra zucchini, <laughs> you know, and the kale, and you know, people always have something that's abundant. I like this year. My all my Christmas presents were apple butter because my neighbor, who's a single guy, had planted an orchard because he had property and he wanted to do that. But he actually didn't have only he had only one mouth, so he couldn't eat all his apples. So <laughs> I just went down every day and I got apples. So. All of that was free food, you know, and you know the foraging places and such. Um, and then there's also, um, it's not so much the trade, but, but there is this ability to grow some yourself. It's also the chanterelles in the forest. It's the, you know, it's the nettles in the spring. It's, it's, I was mowing a weed in my backyard that turned out to be oregano, you know, so it's like, <laughs> You know, in the bush that was flopping over my neighbor's house was rosemary. So it was like, it, the more I ate locally, the more I learned of what was there. You know, and I, I do describe this mystical experience in my backyard where I, I'll just, I'll just read this little section. I know you didn't ask me about mysticism, you asked me about cost, but I'm going here. Uh, I invite uh, you to join me standing in my yard one day in September, looking at my garden, wiggling my toes into the unmowed grass, breathing the soft air, and contemplating what my 10-mile experience was teaching me. I felt something ripple through my body. I felt food. I was in it. I felt the animals and fungi and beneficial plants and ripening fruits and felt not just my nose and eyes responding, but my skin, which nigh onto quivered in response. Uh, and so I describe how it was that I felt food in a total surround. I was no longer a hunter where food was in the market or even in my garden. But I realized that I had co-evolved with my, my, the natural world that I fit here, that I belong here, that this isn't some trick question, you know, no. Food is everywhere. So there's a certain amount of it that's the competency of being able to find the food that adjusts the cost. So, you know, I'm in a river of food, some of it which comes to me for free, and some of which costs a lot more than I would pay in the store. So I don't know how it balances out, and I will do that calculation. Um, there's beans that are, oh, and the other piece of it, that's really interesting. It's like with that $5 pound chicken, you know, like frugal girl goes like, ha ha, I'll eat half as much, and then it's a $2.50 pound chicken. <laughs> 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 you know? But the fact of the matter is, is that chicken really is more flavorful. You go between a local, you know, pastured chicken and a grocery store Purdue or Tyson chicken. And it's day and night. And so actually, I, eating less is actually more nourishing. I have a friend who grows biodynamic grains. It's a particularly like really integrated farming system. And I can eat a handful like that of her barley. And it would satisfy me more than a bowl full of grocery store, even organic brown rice. There's something about that food, how it's grown, that's so nourishing. And the fact of the matter is, is that the other piece is that I've maintained my weight, so I've, I've stopped picking out. Yeah, so. So in the process of doing this and, and interacting with your community, how has your community interacted to the whole scheme? Are they looking at their, their community and saying, gee, we could do with some more chickens, or we, 
How would we survive if we had to, have they started to look at that? That is a perfect question because that's like phase two is, is what I realized is like, I started asking the question, what if everybody did this? Mm -hmm. Well, I realized if a hundred people in Whidbey Island did a 10 mile diet, we would, we would just clean out the local food. That our system is not designed to feed us a total, our total nourishment locally. That you, you start to see that this is just like, you know, stage set in the back of MGM <laughs> lot, you know, okay, corral, you know, it looks, it sort of looks like a food system, but it's not a food system. And this really is the leading edge, not only on Whidbey, it's where I went on Whidbey, like how could we all do this? But it is really the leading edge in the food movement, the good food movement is this intermediate, technologies, you know, of, of processing, distribution, packaging our food so that you can, you grow potatoes, it's one thing, you sell them at a farmer's market, but if you have a potato chip factory, a local potato chip factory, then you have, you're starting to have a food system, you're starting to have products that can, can be distributed more broadly and the farmers can actually make money. So I will read a little section. Because what I did when I got the contract, I had 25,000 words on my blog when I finished the month and I sent a little link to my agent who had sold your money or your life 25 years ago and has waited patiently for me to have another idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I sent her a link and I said, well, what do you think? Is there anything here? She said, get me a proposal right away. And within a month, we'd sold it to Viking. Um, so. Knowing I knew nothing, but I cared a lot, uh, I convened, uh, I'm big into dialogue, it's another one of my interests, and I convened what they call multi-stakeholder dialogue, um, where you, know, you, get, you get all the elements of the food system, the farmers, the eaters, the, the people who buy food for the schools and for the, you know, the grocers and the NGOs and the, the extension service. You get, I got as many people from our food system in the room as possible on a beautiful day in May. We even got farmers. And we did a visioning and backcasting exercise. The visioning part was imagine it's 2020 and 50% of our food that we eat on Whidbey Island comes from Whidbey Island. You know, just wake up, good morning, it's, it's, it's 2020, it's, it's you know, December 31st, 2020. And this was like right in the beginning of 2011. Uh, so it's 10 years later and 50% of our food comes from the island, what does it look like? And so people had conversations and they wrote little ideas on cards and we put the cards up on the wall and we grouped them and, and we developed a story of food 2020, what it looked like. Um, and I'll just read a little bit. Uh, the grocery stores up and down the island are all hybrids. Plenty of industrial food, but so much locally grown food you'd think they were co-ops. Meats, vegetables, and fruits, plus staples like grains, beans, and flour, plus foraged foods like chanterelles and nettles, plus canned and bottled foods like sauces and wines and jellies, soups, honey. Given the rise of the price of oil and gas, the prices for local food are finally competitive. Um, micro food networks have formed among neighbors who together plan what each will grow and share. Restaurants focus their menus on what's fresh or what's, in, uh, what's been stored over the winter. Whidbey is a culinary tourist, tourism destination, this is my next business, uh, with solar powered tour buses meeting the ferries for a series of gastronomic and educational adventures. Um, in addition to home delivery systems, we have two food hubs north and south. Trucks fan out every day, picking up produce from farms, bringing it to the hub, putting together orders to stock the restaurants and grocers, as well as filling orders from the hospitals, schools, and naval air station. Each hub has a retail section where people buy fresh food and enjoy soup and bread lunch. The bread made from fresh milled local flour leavened by local sourdough starter from our free range wild yeast spores and lactic acid bacteria. And I will say about this, so I mean, this is a piece of what I am starting to intuit is that, is that it's important to start the conversation. Just like, how can we do that? What do you think? What would it look like if, just keeping that conversation, you know, what are the barriers? How can we overcome them? Because that little thing about the mill, we now have a grain mill. So this is, what, four years later. And a baker has come to town and, and bought out a restaurant that was sort of like, you know, destined to fail ex-hippie 
you know, <laughs> location. And she's bought it and she's put in a bakery and, and she's committed to as much local grain in her breads as possible. So they bought a mill and now they're milling the grain for my friend Georgina, the biodynamic farmer. And so now we do have a local loaf. So there's something, I won't go into the, more and more of this, um, but um, this was what was generated by, you know, like third generation farmers. This isn't la la land. You know, this was what we saw when we thought about it. We just didn't know how to get there. And I think that that dialogue was a piece of the process of arriving at these innovations. Um, oh, it says, here it says, some have returned to animal power, oxen and horses, to run their farms. Well, we now have that. <laughs> there's, there's somebody who is doing horse farming. Um, so, so these things are all moving along. And, um, and once you start to ask, how can local food, like the question is, well, can local food feed the world? In other words, ha, 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 industrial system wins again, you know. <laughs> you know? It, it's, that's not a question of it feeding the world, first of all, because our vision there, and I think my vision still, is an integrated system where, we, where local food scales up from 5% of what we eat to 10, 20, maybe up to 50% of our fresh fruits and vegetables, meats and grains and beans, you know, fish if we, if we live on the coast, that as much as possible, it's that principle of subsidiarity. How can we meet our food needs as close to home as possible for the freshness and nutrition, but also for the local prosperity and having real, living, thriving communities that are not gutted by people being totally dependent on industrial systems. So I think that there's going to be an integrated system. And my idea about this is that I call it a complementary food system that you know, with medicine, you know, you, you know, some procedures like acupuncture or Chinese medicine, well, that was quackery. Oh, and then it was, oh, it's alternative treatments. And, but eventually, as the research came in, alternative treatments became defined by the establishment as complementary medicine, covered by insurance. You know, doctors who practice both allopathic and naturopathic medicine are often now more popular than the straight allopathic doctors. So you can see that, that ideas that are like this, that are really good, will come in to the center. And the center will not ever acknowledge it's a better idea. It'll just simply say, well, it's a complementary system. So I think we should have complementary food systems. You know, that where we say for national security, you know, we can't depend on other countries you know, for our melamine, no, I meant to say milk. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? They found that China was putting melamine in, in dairy products. Um, so, so for the toxins in our food, for the food, you know, for the, the health of our food, but also for our sovereignty, that not being completely beholden to, to systems that, you know, that, that we abhor, I mean, how are we going to protest Monsanto's practices when we're utterly dependent on, uh, on the food system that Monsanto is increasingly owning? So if you want to be a radical and a revolutionary, support this. If you want to be healthy, if you want to have healthy kids, support it. I have another question. Okay. Yeah. So does your local government start to look at the economics of this? Well, we and wish they would. Because one of the biggest problems I see, you know, living where we do, is the cost of land is so ridiculous exactly. that you can't afford to have that farm. You can't exactly. afford to grow Exactly. Exactly. Let's see. I have another little section here. Um, yeah, some hobby farmers have given up their city homes and moved here lock, stock, and rain barrel. Tax breaks put, uh, uh, for putting at least 50% of their property in agriculture encourage some of them to even give five-year leases to young farmers who grow food for them and the community. All this means that the average age of farmers on Whidbey is now under 50. So we're, we need really innovative mechanisms. Given that we are a private property society, we need innovative mechanisms that will allow young and new farmers to get secure tenure to farm, to land that they can farm in the way they choose to, not just be tenant farmers, not just be production farmers, but farmer farmers. And <laughs> are you smiling about that? You looked at Melamine. I didn't know what it was. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, that's a new thing about being a, doing a public talk. People are on their iPhones trying to figure out what you're talking about. I didn't know what you were talking 
Yeah. It's okay. It's perfect. Okay. So yes, that's true. It's like once you commit to it, you see what the barriers are. And for me, every barrier is an opportunity. Yeah. They're just opportunities for creativity. And it's not that it's going to be easy, but I think this is a the coolest collaborative project we could have of how are we... And if you asked our children to start thinking about this problem, then maybe we would be ready for the solution. Totally. And, you know, it's like, it's like I feel, I used to think that my generation had failed, you know, that we had, on our watch, all of this degradation had happened. And that younger people, I just didn't even want to talk to them because I knew they hated me. <laughs> but, but what I found is that, is that younger people have considered my generation the pioneer generation, sort of like the you know, opening up the ice flows generation. You know, we're the ones who opened up the possibilities. And the younger generation wants us in partnership and considers themselves the maker generation, the generation that's going to implement and, and uh, operationalize these values that we've been able to like break open into the culture. Uh, and I think that's a great partnership. And so it's not even my, it's, my job is to, is this, is a, this is another piece of what I want to say, is um, this whole narrative on hope. Um, as an activist, I had lost hope after a decade of working my buns off on, on trying to reduce consumption in North America, trying to like address the biggest problem, which is overconsumption. And trying to, you know, get pry people's fingers off of their, you know, their remote for their <laughs> 16 devices, um, and uh, I lost hope. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that happened in between. But I realized when I, when I relocalization became my only locus of hope. It was like, I I don't know that we're going to change the big data. I don't know if we're going to change the big systems. But I do see that there's a a, um, a sliver of a, an open field here on the relocalization front that we can, as communities, we can learn how to do this locally, providing for ourselves food, fiber, uh, fuel, many other, our needs, water, electricity. Um, and that we can share, hopefully keep the internet up, we can share stories, we can learn together collaboratively over the whole, you know, just small-scale human settlements connected via the internet and other, other means, learning together how to, how to re-inhabit real places on the planet. That was my hope. Uh, and this book came out of it. But I realized when I started writing it that I was still in despair about what, how we had come to this place. I was in despair about the situation. I was in despair about all the things that we tried and hadn't done. And I, was hanging out with some young activist friends of mine in Brazil, and, and they were saying, oh, because Brazil has more, it has, it has more ebullience than we do for, by a long shot. And um, they, was, they were talking about, oh, we're going we're gonna, to you know, get together and farm, buy some land and farm a community. And I was like, been there, done that, doesn't work. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I could hear myself. I could hear my despair as something that I was passing on. And I realized it was my responsibility as an elder to not do that. To number one, to recognize, even though the data points in the direction of all sorts of distress, that it's not, it's, it's, it's not predictive. I'm holding data that I think is pretty true. It's been, it was true before, it's true now, but it's not the whole story. And I thought my data was the whole story. Second is, I don't know what's going to happen an hour from now. I can't say that the data that I've been living with or under, you know, as a rain cloud, is predictive of what's going to happen in the future. It's, the future is not settled. It's not, oh, the future isn't over. It's still the future. You know? <laughs> but I had it as over. I had it as done. And so I had to be surrendered. I had to be humble enough to say, no, I actually don't know. I had to be humble enough to say, these people, these younger people who are looking at me, they may go further than we did. They may succeed where we failed. Oh, dear. <laughs> so it's like the story is not over with my generation, which the boomers always thought that it was. You know, I just want to just finish this little piece, and then I'll stop. Um, so I realized that hope is the space into which to create. You can't smash people's hope. You can't close down the space 
in which they will create by saying, been there, done that, tried it, isn't going to work. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it to other people. It's your responsibility to hold that open because what do you know? Maybe there is hope. And so I see hope as that hospitality, that, that quality of life that is always creating. The seed falls in the ground and it doesn't like have an inner dialogue about, well, you know, like I just heard about this, all these other seeds and just they sprouted and no rain came. I'm just not going to even bother. You know? <laughs> that is not the nature of life. The nature of life is this sort of generous expectancy that I will sprout, I will go for it. It's just this quality of going for it. And that's who we are. And that's our patrimony. And that's what's going on. And so I don't know where that thing came from that I just, why I just said that. But that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, it is in this, so, oh, I want to read this paragraph. So knowing this, even hope seems too small a ground to stand on. I now have trust. Hope allows us to act with expectancy. Trust allows us to relax into what is, into the resilience of life itself. Hope is our relationship with the future. Trust is our relationship with the eternal present. Hope lets us try. Trust gives us the assurance that we are not inventing but rather cooperating with forces more powerful than our little human wills. It is in this spirit of trust that I invite you to read on, to ask, how can I, where I live, engage in this work of food system restoration? You'll be cooperating with a movement that's growing, well, like weeds. Young people in droves want to farm now. In fact, most of the young people I now know consider my generation and me the fireweed in lodgepole pine, the early uh, the early um, openers of, a, of open land, they are about to grow a new forest. So I would like to, that's the end of what I'm going to say, except if there's a question. Somebody had her, their hand raised. Well, it wasn't a question. I just, um, the, the idea of the hope uh, reminds me, of, I have a great nephew who's been hired by Amherst College to, to, to run a farm there. They've decided to um, feed their students from the farm, from the food that they grow. And therefore, as you say, there are more and more young people who are, are going back into the farming, at least I know in Massachusetts and Maine and parts of the East, um, and probably here. Right. That's hope. So, so I think hope is alive in that sense. I do too. I, I think that's what I would invite you to just consider at the end, uh, in, in addition to hopefully buying my book and enjoying it, uh, is that wherever you put your ore in, whether it's growing some sprouts on the windowsill, whether it's shopping, joining a CSA or shopping at a farmer's market or asking your grocer where the beans in that bin come from and, and asking why they don't have local food in the market. Any place you want to put your hands in the dirt, it's really worthwhile because you are entering this um, process of life coming back to life. And it, so I feel like this is my, the work of the rest of my life, that I wrote another book called Your Money or Your Life, which was really trying to help people decode the money system and extricate themselves from it. But it didn't say much about life. It just said, there is such a thing called life, and, and you don't want to miss it by spending all your time making a dying. But I feel like this book gives me an opportunity to cooperate with life and to be on the side of life. So I will be signing books over there for those of you who want to buy a book. And I thank you so much for being here. This is a great nice juicy big group of people <laughs> and you're not all just my friends so but now you are thank you